started now. Um, welcome to this webinar on bringing flow to work on the topic of maximizing natural intelligence in the age of AI. Um, so just to set a little context, first of all, I want to thank all of you for coming very much. And I think I suspect many of you are, uh, if not most of you are auto rabbit customers. And so I want to really thank you uh, for working with us to help enable your enterprise and enable you to deliver flow to your organizations. Uh, I'm Andrew Davis. I'm the Chief Product Officer at AutoRabbit, also uh, author just recently of this book, Flow Engineering, which is some of the, um, the reason for sharing thoughts on flow in this webinar. This is a talk that I gave uh, at our user conference, DevHops, in Las Vegas a few months ago in the fall. And so I'm uh, resharing this now in a public forum and really delighted to have a chance to share some of these ideas with everyone. So uh, I wanted to start off by introducing this concept of NI, NI, natural intelligence, as opposed to artificial intelligence. And so the world's been abuzz about artificial intelligence recently, but natural intelligence is a noun. It is the opposite. It's the definition is the opposite of artificial intelligence. NI is the opposite of artificial intelligence. It is the intelligence created by nature, plant, animal, human intelligence. The term natural intelligence was actually coined by AI research researchers when trying to describe and make a distinction between what do, you know, what are we building uh, in with um, silicon, for example, versus what exists made out of carbon in our very own world. So what I wanted to talk about today is... <clears throat> this distinction between natural and artificial intelligence, and then taking that taking us into this topic of flow, flow and the future of work, and resetting a little bit on some of the underlying challenges we face building on the Salesforce platform, and just resetting on what are, what is it that we're trying to do anyway, and I'm projecting a little bit onto you as the reader that you're in some way involved in the Salesforce development lifecycle, pretty safe bet. Um, for people coming to our webinar, and then go and look a little bit more at the challenge of Salesforce development in the context of flow. I, I suppose I need to clarify that if you come to this webinar looking for more information on Salesforce flows, you will you will be disappointed. Um, so this might it's like when you get on a plane and they say, this plane is going to Las Vegas. If you don't want to go to Las Vegas, you should get off the plane right now. So this talk is going to be talking about the broader meaning of flow, not just Salesforce flows, but flow in the sense, uh, in flow in two senses. And I'll get to that later, but it's the internal sense of like the creative experiences, you know, um, what um, is called a flow state, psychological state of flow. On the one meaning, and the second meaning is um, team workflow, smooth, um, smooth, easy, waste-free handoffs from one person to another to another to enable work to get done much more effectively. So that's the the broader context. So um, I have the opportunity at my work and my job to use an NI system uh, on a daily basis. It is the most advanced computer on the planet. It has 86 billion parallel processors, 100 trillion network connections, holographic data storage, autonomous decision-making, all while being sustainable and energy efficient. Um, so the NI system that I look uh, that I use at work looks a lot like this. If you were to take the covers off and look at it, looks something like this. Now, uh, I don't know of the participants how many of you might be bots or not, but those of you who are not bots, you're probably operating with some very similar hardware like this. These are very, very impressive statistics. Um, and so the it's important for us to um, not give up hope yet that uh, AI is um, surpassing humans because there's a phenomenal amount of capabilities that humans are vastly better at uh, than AI. So there are two levels of natural intelligence. And the first, this is coming to this, this double meaning of flow. The first is individual intelligence, which you could think of as the problem solving capacity of an individual. When an individual is faced with a problem, um, how, how readily can they solve that? Um, and this is, this is one way of understanding intelligence. Intelligence is the ability to hold on to a repertoire of methods for solving different kinds of problems and to be able to, when you encounter a new problem, to 
categorize it, to classify it and say, oh, this is the problem of pulling a lid off the bottle. Okay, well, I pull it, that doesn't work. Okay, let me try twisting it, right? It's my intelligence it enables me to select from various options to solve the problem. Now, there's also a social intelligence and social intelligence is based on individuals, but it's it's actually an emergent capacity of groups. It's not something that is that you can understand just by the capabilities of individuals. It's it's very, very well known that you can hire all the smartest people, right, to a company, and then they don't perform well together. Like you can hire very excellent athletes um, or recruit excellent athletes onto a team, but they don't necessarily perform well together as a team because there's some additional emergent capacity that requires those individuals to coordinate very, very well together. So when we're talking about natural intelligence, we're talking about these two levels. There is an intelligence or lack of intelligence to our organizations as well as uh, as well as there is to individuals. And that takes us to this topic of flow, flow and the future of work. So um, I it helps me periodically to reflect that the most energetic hours of the most energetic days of the most energetic years of our lives are spent at work. Probably many of you are at work right now. I'm at work. Um, um, for life to be meaningful, work must be meaningful, right? If you want the, if you're giving the very best part of your life to something, work, you you need that work to be meaningful for your life to be meaningful. And so, a few guidelines on that, you know, some simple um, rubric I use to think about living a meaningful life: do do something that brings real benefit to others. Do have a good time while doing it. Do build meaningful relationships that nourish the social web. And don't cause harm to any living being as much as possible. So this, if you can figure out a way to guide your life within these parameters, I would say you are doing great. You're doing very well. Um, one of my favorite quotes is from the management theorist Peter Drucker, um, who said that the purpose of an organization is to enable ordinary human beings to do extraordinary things. And I find that very, very powerful. And, and people love you know, the idea of AI that allows you as an ordinary human being to do something extraordinary, like say a few words, and then all of a sudden, an amazing, futuristic uh, picture, you know, photorealistic landscape is created from just creating a few words. That's extraordinary. That's amazing. And people, you know, are rightly impressed with AI in that way. But it's similarly amazing in your, you know, your work, you enable an organization to function. You know, you do something, maybe it's something related to Salesforce, maybe you're an admin or a developer, release manager, something like that. You do something related to Salesforce, but that's part of enabling an organization to do something amazing, right? So, um, you know, I was, I was recently uh, at um, Starbucks headquarters in Seattle and working with their development team, the team that builds the apps and so forth that you can, people can use to order coffee and so forth. And, you know, it's, it's maybe not, it's not um, saving lives, I guess, Starbucks, but it is saving days. It's, it's like saving people's work day, you know, but the people who are building that app, they're doing extraordinary things. They're enabling people around the world to, you know, order a coffee and have it ready when they arrive. I mean, it's a simple thing or it's not, it's not, you know, it's not like delivering clean water to everyone in the world and so forth, but it is, it's extraordinary. It's amazing what is possible to accomplish with an organization. So work operates within constraints and every organization operates within constraints. We've got a variety of constraints, business constraints, like profitability is the primary one, personal constraints. Do I like being in this job? Am I satisfied with my job? Social constraints. Do people see me as a helpful person? Do people see me as someone who is, um, you know, bringing them benefit and they can trust and so forth? And overall, we we operate uh, as much as, you know, people might wish to deny it. We we operate within the reality of an ecosystem, and so hence, you know, we're we're subject to all of these constraints. And we need to figure out this uh, problem in engineering. You call this constrained optimization. How do you optimize what you're doing within this variety of constraints? And that is 
that it's hard enough, even if the world were just to stay still. You could spend the rest of your life trying to optimize that with the world staying still. Unfortunately, not only is the world complicated, the world is complex in the sense that the world is continuously changing and the things that we do cause the world to change even more, right? And so this ever-changing nature of the world makes the problem even more difficult, um, requires continuous optimization and improvement. And just when you get everything perfect in your personal life or at work or your desk's perfect and so forth, everything's perfect, and then it's not, and then the world changes, right? And so we're, we're operating, the fundamental constraint that underlies all of these is this constraint of impermanence. And what was okay before, you know, yesterday, a month ago, a year ago, 20 years ago, 100 years ago, is not okay today because the world is changing. And so optimizing, but we're doing knowledge work. And so we, what's interesting about knowledge work is we're not just producing physical widgets. We're not just producing coffee or uh, cars or something like that. Knowledge work is a, is a, is a very interesting thing, right? You, we get paid to understand things and to come up with new knowledge and to solve problems, to thinking jobs, thinking process. And we know that there's times when we think better and times when we think not as well. Um, and so psychological flow is, is a state, uh, I think I've got, uh, let me see, I'll, I'll describe this state of psychological flow here. Uh, and I'll come back to some of those slides. But this idea was popularized by a psychologist in the 80s, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, in a book, in a book called Flow, that the state of psychological flow is where you're operating in this sweet spot where the challenges that you're dealing with are reasonably well matched to your skill level. And if something, if your skills are too high for the level of challenge, you'll get bored. It's like, uh, not really the flow challenge. If the challenge is too high for your skill level, you'll get very anxious. Right? But there is a sweet spot between that anxiety and boredom that as the as your skill level increases and the challenges get get harder and so forth, and you probably had that experience to whatever degree you've ever played video games. There's always a next harder level, but that's also probably your experience in your work, right? There's this idea that you know you get a job and then you get promoted, and then the next you know promote the job you're promoted into. Maybe you got promoted from being a technical worker to a people manager. The job you get promoted into, that's stress stretching or stressing a totally different set of skills than you had before. You've gone to the next level. Now you're a people manager and you've got to figure out how to help, you know, uh, help keep everybody organized and moving in the right direction. And so this continuous escalation of skills, uh, continuous escalation of challenges, meeting with our skills creates this internal state of flow, which is a state of concentration that is intrinsically rewarding, where you're really, you know, in the zone, you're jamming, whatever you want to call it. Um, you're in a state of concentration. And that is the state in which the most creative work comes out. And so the times in your life where you have done really good work, whether that was software de development or, you know, writing or, um, you know, brainstorming with some other team or playing a game or whatever else, those are states of flow. So when we're wanting to optimize knowledge work, we need to optimize staying in a state of flow as much as we can um, to generate the creative output that's so beneficial and so valuable, as well balancing that with team workflow, helping to make sure that we're coordinating well with those around us because we can't, yeah, that's a whole other dynamic. And so because there are these two levels, personal flow and then team workflow, there there's, you know, you can't really achieve a digital transformation without both personal transformation and a social transformation. The, Personal transformation involves, you know, getting to know your digital tools and plugging into a, you know, a, a work process that is satisfying and so forth. And the social transformation is making sure that you've got smooth, easy handoffs between everybody in the organization. And this, um, this is a saying from Michael Ballet, a very uh, prominent uh, a theorist on the nature of work, um, organizational psychology and so forth, that you need to focus as an organization if you're a technology worker, technology manager, running a team in any capacity like this, you are very, very, very wise to focus on building people before building products, build people before building products. So this characteristic of psychological flow that I introduced, it's creative, it's productive, it's satisfying. Um, and it is, 
it's it's the most productive, the most satisfying part of our work from an individual point of view. Um, it's necessary for really highly productive team, just like you for a highly productive sports team, you need or a highly effective sports team, you need you know strong individual athletes. But it's not sufficient. If you, you can't just have a workplace where you hire everybody to stay in flow all the time, like playing video games, um, without some significant levels of coordination. And so this takes us to understanding what we're talking about when we talk about coordinating teams. Uh, this is a horrifically oversimplified summary of uh, the history of, of manufacturing and the history of um, teamwork organizational um, patterns. But the, the most classic pattern of work is what you could call craft production. That's up here. I mean, and people have been doing craft production since you know, you know, from one point of view, since Paleolithic times, like somebody, you know, uh, carving stones and goes and trades them for some corn and so forth. Craft production, you know, you can still find it in some places around the world, but in general, it's it started disappearing um, dramatically with the Industrial Revolution. And pretty much by the 1950s, it became very hard to find financially viable businesses, financially viable industries that were primarily built around craft production. Um, um, and, you know, the idea of moving from a blacksmith who would make some steel to steel foundries and, and uh, manufacturing facilities and so forth. And so all of this craft production is given way to the era of mass production. And you could define that as starting in the 1920s. Of course, its, it's roots are earlier with the Industrial Revolution. But the 1920s, when you start seeing these huge assembly lines and just massive, large scale industrial production, and that is now responsible for, I mean, if you look around you, if I'm looking around my environment, I'm, there's a table here, there's windows over there, there's doors, steel, you know, lights and so forth. Everything I'm looking at almost has been produced by uh, mass production, industrial processes, producing chairs and tables and bottles, all these kinds of things. Trans, utterly transformative of the world. But from the 50s, this movement within that grew out um, of lean production. And lean production, the, the idea of lean production is to, you know, okay, so we figured out how to tackle some of these big logistical challenges like, um, you know, um, assembly lines and transportation and so forth. Lean production was all about, okay, now that you've got the basics in place, how do you get the individual worker engaged? Because the idea of uh, mass, mass production was really quite dehumanizing in a lot of ways, or the or many versions of mass production were very, very dehumanizing. And that legacy is still with us today. To the degree that you are, to the degree that you being creative, thoughtful at work, you know, uh, engaging intellectually with your colleagues, problem solving and so forth, to the degree that that's not what you're asked to do at work, that's a remnant of this era of mass production. The idea of lean production is you've got all these workers, whether they're building cars or making candy or whatever they're doing, you've got all these workers. They're each equipped with this amazing brain. They're each equipped with this incredible natural uh, intelligence, as I was mentioning, 80 billion parallel processors, 80 billion neurons and so forth. Everyone is born uh, learning. Everyone has a natural capacity for scientific thinking. Let's liberate that and really learn how to hyper-optimize what we're doing. And the results of that are really, truly transformative. And so lean software development, um, you know, when we talk about agile and so forth, it's a, it's an outgrowth of this lean software development movement, but lean software is uh, still, you know, manifesting in the DevOps movement and so forth. And that's um, borrowing from these ideas of lean production. And when you look at all of these approaches to lean production, when you look at DevOps or Agile and so forth, the, the focus is on what on optimizing the flow of work, as, as the slide says here, but, but something of a feedback loop. So on the bottom, you've got this left to right feedback loop from generating an idea, business hypothesis. I've got an idea. What if we were to 
do this thing. You know, we build some new application, internal application, you know, commercial application, whatever. Maybe people would find that beneficial. And your your hypothesis, you're hoping to deliver customer satisfaction, but in that process, you need to go through a planning process and design, maybe coding, testing it, delivering it, training people on it and so forth. And what you'll inevitably find is that it kind of works, hopefully, at least, hopefully at least it kind of works, but maybe some parts don't quite work well and they could be better and people actually wanted something different and so forth. And that kicks back this learning loop. And so uh, the DevOps movement um, popularized this idea of the three ways of work. The first is flow from the left, uh, the sort of left to right as we, as we draw these diagrams. Um, flow of, uh, you know, from idea to, to value, the value stream, feedback being the second way of DevOps, the, the you know, hearing what people are saying and responding to that and so forth. And then the third way is uh, continuous learning and improvement. And so that really, the process of continuous learning and adaptation and improvement is central to, to flow. And, and flow, even the name flow, it just implies there is no flow if there is no movement, right? Flow implies change. And that's why, we, you know, many people, I'm not the first to, to use this term to, to point to this need for continuous change, continuous adaptation, adaptation of our processes, our products, and, and that is the process of learning. And so that takes me back to this question of what is it that we are really trying to do as organizations if we... Um, you know, if we boil down what is our actual job, assuming you're somewhere in the Salesforce development space, one question we could start by asking is why are we using Salesforce in the first place? Like, why are we building on Salesforce? And I have a number of reasons that are you know, a summary of what is probably broadly true. When you use a tool like Salesforce, you're you're kind of adopting industry standards. And so if Salesforce has said, okay, the industry standard is you start with leads and then you've got opportunities and you can track uh, which account they're tied to and contact and the opportunities go through a pipeline and then we can do forecasts and so forth. There are different ways that you could manage a sales process, but to the, when you buy Salesforce, you're basically agreeing, okay, let's use that as our way of managing opportunities. And let's also use service cloud and let's use um, entitlements. And so basically when you adopt their application, you're adopting their assumptions and, and then it's creating some level of standardization across the industry. When you build on Salesforce, you get somebody else to handle the servers. You know, somebody else is handling the network infrastructure, you know, great. That's a big job you don't have to do. Um, it allows you to have apps that are integrated across the business. It makes it easier to build things because you've got a low code development platform. Um, and there's a one reason why you may be building on Salesforce, which is because they were building on Salesforce when you got there, you know, that the company maybe has been building on it for 10 years and maybe you wouldn't have chosen Salesforce, but sorry, you know, it's, it's there, you've got some momentum. And so, we're building on Salesforce partly because we're building on Salesforce. Uh, and But if we ask what depends on Salesforce, so the the, the crown jewels of your company's data, the, your essential cust customer contact data, uh, not to mention the potential and actual deals that you've got in play with them. Um, typically, now there's an increasing number of production applications for managing many, many different aspects of the business. Salesforce is trying to be everything for everybody. Um, and many, many people's daily lives involve logging into Salesforce at least once a day, if not all day, every day. Um, and many customers also, their interactions with the company are also through Salesforce. So if you look at all of that, the storage of data, all of the use cases, um, you realize that actually your whole business has become entangled with Salesforce for better or for worse, right? Your your whole business depends on Salesforce. And so that brings to this question I mentioned about flow, the nature of flow is change, right? There's always a flow. So if if you could just set Salesforce up correctly the one time, and never need to go back and change anything about it. Well, there would certainly not be any need for 
companies like AutoRabbit, there would be no need for doing deployments or developers on Salesforce and so forth. Everything's just done one time and you leave it and great. We're actually, AutoRabbit, for example, is in the change business. We enable change. Our goal is to safely deliver change on Salesforce. Um, so why do we need to change Salesforce? Because, well, you know, we've learned a lot since we first started building on it, you know, five years ago. Five years ago, we didn't think that this would happen, but now we've discovered it did. And so now we need to change something. So that's one reason. Also, your business processes are changing. So you use Salesforce to automate business processes. The business processes change. You need to change Salesforce. Your market is changing. You've got new lines of business. Uh, maybe you're acquiring and so the businesses. You need to consolidate some applications. Maybe you need to split applications. You need processes that need to be unified across the world. Or you need processes that um, like... Uh, Maybe your, some parts of your purchasing procurement process need to be unified, standardized across the world. Maybe some parts need to be differentiated, right? You move into a new region and there's a new law and you've got to do something different in Germany than you did somewhere else. And Anyway, continuous change, because your business is changing continuously um, from outside forces and from inside forces, your sales force needs to change. Your sales force implementation needs to change. And I would argue that adapting these IT systems, making these IT systems change over time, that is actually a kind of organizational learning. It's not, you know, it's not exactly human learning, but it is a mechanism for human learning. So, for example, um, if if one day your users show up and there's a new button uh in your Salesforce instance that says, you know, click here if you need to report a problem with your working situation or something like that. By rolling that out across all your employees, you're teaching them that they have a new option, or maybe you take a button away and you're teaching them that they don't have an option. And so you actually change your employees' understanding of how to work with other people in the company as you change the Salesforce system. And so although from one point of view, it looks like you're just changing IT systems, what you're actually doing is you're also changing the social systems and the psychological uh, assumptions that people make when they come to work. And so that these, these are all entangled and that there's not really, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lie to think that there are IT systems and humans they're entangled. They're all one entangled system, uh, what you'd call a cybernetic system. So when you adapt IT systems, you're helping the business to learn, okay, well, this is the new calculation we need to do. So let's build that algorithm, right? And you're, you know, you, but you're embedding that learning in, in the logic of the software. There's a, a quote from this French, um, um, is a, um, business strategist, I think maybe he was also a diplomat, Ari de Guise, the ability to learn faster than your competitors may be the only sustainable competitive advantage. The ability to learn faster than your competitors may be the only sustainable competitive advantage. You can roll out a new product and some somebody could copy that product within months or at least a, you know, at least a few years, they could copy that and have the same product, maybe even a bit better, right? So it's very hard to get a sustainable competitive advantage unless what he's saying here is the only potentially sustainable competitive advantage is if you can learn faster than your competitors. You can be a company that is learning, growing, changing faster than your competitors. And that's why we need to optimize our ability to safely deliver change, both individually and collectively with our IT systems as well. And so when we talk about the main function, the main purpose of um, AutoRabbit, the CI, CD product at least, um, you're talking about making changes to your production Salesforce orgs. Um, you start with a reliable copy of production. You need to understand which parts of the thing that you need to change. You need to make a change that works. You need to make sure you didn't break anything else. If something doesn't work, you need to roll it back. You use, use version control, presumably, to have a, a way to roll it back. If it does work, you roll the changes out to production, and then you need to check and follow up and see if it actually helped your end users. And then you just keep repeating the cycle. And this is the software development life cycle. Um, if you kind of boil it down into abstract components, um, 
one way that we like to depict this here in uh, at, at AutoRabbit is with this, what we call the flow of code diagram, which is if you imagine development here and you've got an integration environment, some kind of QA or UAT environment, some kind of production environment, that there are these cyclical processes that are that are in operation. There's a process of developers moving cyclically through this process of understanding the user story, understanding the, the application they're trying to build, seeing how it works today, you know, comparing that with what they wanted to do, running tests and so forth. So there's a cyclical process even within an individual developer's workflow. And then they maybe send it out to the QA team. And maybe it passes the first time, requires a little bit of analysis, maybe it gets sent back, right? And that's part of this feedback loop coming back from these later stages. But maybe it flows onwards to the next, to the UAT phase, for example. And again, the users are beginning to interact with it and saying, yeah, I understand that that works and that doesn't work. And could you do it like this? And could you move this here? Maybe send some feedback back to the developers. And so for them, maybe it passes and you send it out to production. But then you need to be monitoring uh, for usage, adoption, and so forth. And um, and getting that feedback back to the development team. So when we're talking about flow in the context of software development, it's these kinds of movements of information, basically. Uh, and it is effectively invisible, this stuff, but if you were to actually fully visualize the, the work process that we're participating in and the mental process and the, the degree to which an idea gradually matures its way into becoming realized in production and then gradually uh, is evolved based on you know changing needs for the business and so forth you could depict it in in a way like this right this flow of code it is a cycle of continuous change it's a cycle of continuous change and that's what we're talking about flow now flow the opposite of flow is stagnation right so if you you know, uh, work on something, you send it to QA and it takes, you know, weeks to get through QA, you send it to UAT, nobody even looks at it, right? You send it to production, nobody uses your application. That's the opposite of flow, right? Um, that's stagnation. And so flow really implies you want to have the most po dynamic possible process you could hope for. And that, and that the whole optimization around software development is moving closer and closer to a state of flow. For example, a request comes from production, sent to the development team. You immediately understand what they needed. You understand what you need to change to deliver that. You make the change, you roll it out to the testing, it passes the tests, you roll it out to the users, they love it. You roll it out to production, it changes people's behavior, it makes the business better. That would be an ideal state of flow, right? This, this smooth cycle, it's ideal which means by definition, it never perfectly happens like that, but we can move towards it. And that's the the other meaning of an ideal is that you can move towards it pro progressively and continually and uh, moving towards that. So uh, one other way to summarize this is the idea of promoting safe, clean code to production, promoting clean, safe code to production. So taking this back a little bit to Salesforce and some of the unique challenges in the Salesforce space, Salesforce, first of all, um, the good news about Salesforce, um, that Salesforce has done, I believe, I don't know of any enterprise software company that has done more to enable citizen developers and enable um, to democratize development, basically. And because of that, trying to reduce the barrier of entry to becoming a Salesforce developer, something like that, there are a relatively large number of developers and admins, consultancies, it's not too hard to find someone uh, to do that work. And that's that's often quite tricky. Um, there's platforms like Pega, Pega Systems, where it's sort of famously hard to find Pega experts in the world. And so it you know, creates some problems. You build applications on Pega, it's not so easy to find somebody who can maintain it. Um, so Salesforce has done a great job with the enablement of the development developers and admins. Salesforce continues to innovate um, and they maintain a very, very stable, robust, reliable platform. Um, and that and that our companies, I mean, if you're with, with a company that continues to invest in Salesforce, then that, you know, means there's continued value and need in, in 
uh, in building on that platform. However, um, one of the main things about Salesforce is it makes things easy, very easy for individual developers and so forth, but very, very hard when you scale it up. So Salesforce unlocks, because you've got so many people with a fairly modest you know, computer science background, building huge applications very, very quickly on Salesforce, um, it unlocks a lot of big issues at scale. Um, so the underlying architecture of Salesforce, the primary architecture, the metadata architecture was designed between 20 and 25 years ago. Um, it's, I, I hope Parker Harris is not listening on this call, but it, it's, a, it's a lot like Microsoft Access on steroids, Salesforce. Um, you can't use conventional programming languages. So if you have skill from Python or Ruby or something like that, you can't use that to build on Salesforce. Uh, and so th that actually keeps a lot of traditional developers out of Salesforce from moving in, which means their knowledge, their skills, and so forth, the Salesforce community is not benefiting nearly as much as they might from the knowledge of traditional software developers. DevOps tools and processes in Salesforce are limited by what Salesforce makes possible. And so you can't do nearly as much as you might be able to do with the custom application development. And then also, I feel the Achilles heel for Salesforce development is that is that modularization is typically absent or difficult. Um, you can't make a clear distinction. You know, this team manages this metadata, this other team manages this metadata. That's, uh, that's hard. And why do we have this situation? Some of it is a natural consequence of what we wanted. So what we asked for were fully integrated applications. Give me an application that has everything, that ties all of my company's data together in one place. And what do you get? A massive monolithic database. Salesforce is one. You can access any bit of information in Salesforce from any other bit of information because it's all one big massive monolith. You want low cost developers uh, who can you know, easily build things with low code. Uh, and what you get are very inexperienced developers on average. Uh, you want fast development. What you get is technical debt. You want somebody else to manage security. And then you get a team that doesn't know much about security. You get very, very vulnerable things in Salesforce that people just weren't paying attention to because they weren't thinking about security. You want AI, everything, AI, all the things. Uh, at some point, if you get enough AI building in your Salesforce org, nobody's going to understand what's in there, why is it in there, and so forth. So there's an enormous number of risks, current and future risks, um, arising. So if if you think about the impact of AI, um, I can I can say about the impact of AI that I don't know. I don't know what the full scope of the impact of AI will be. It's it's, it's technically impossible to predict, and certainly um, my abilities to predict are very, very limited. But one reasonably likely scenario is that devs and admins are going to be increasingly powered by co-pilot type services, that a lot of things that typically might have taken longer to do in Salesforce become you know faster and easier to do. Um, and so there might be an increase in productivity the amount of stuff you can build in your Salesforce platform. There might also be a reduction in the level of skill that's required to build things, just like there was with a move to low code. But what that does is as you're accelerating productivity and putting more and more and more and more and more stuff into the org, that shifts the burden from cre it's hard to create things to it's hard to understand what's already there. It's hard to maintain things. Uh, that'll shift the burden to an increase in technical debt. And it will increase the need for either conventional tools or AI powered tools to help make sense of what on earth is going on in, the, in our works. Um, and that, that idea for the capacity for something to be made visible, intelligible, understandable to human beings is, is incredibly powerful. Um, that's why at AutoRabbit, we talk a lot about visibility and the importance of visual thinking and making things visible. So this is a monolith. This is a monolith. Now, you might think that this was placed here by aliens. Um, uh, this is in the Utah Red Rock uh, Desert. The theory is that uh, it wasn't aliens, it was artists. 
uh, a group of artists put this monolith there in the desert. Um, this is also a monolith. This is a depiction of dependencies in a Salesforce org. And the characteristic of a monolith is that it's one big, one big ball of mud, one big, everything's connected to everything else. Um, it's basically one piece. There are not separate distinctive bits. And this is because in this particular org, this is an org that I'd analyzed now uh, quite a number of years ago, but um, analyzing the metadata dependencies, everything's tied to everything in Salesforce. And that is quite tricky. Uh, that, from a software development point of view, that means that if you make change to any one little bit, you make a change to something over here, well, what might that affect? Well, it might affect something over here, totally other side of the org. You, you, hard to predict the impacts um, of change that you make. Um, and so that's one one of the big challenges. Um, you know, version control, like trying to make sense of your Salesforce org with version control, you end up with this, you know, tangled spaghetti monster of um, branches, right? It's uh, it's it's a hard problem as people are trying to manage some of these things. So um, really sharing these thoughts, partly just to ground you in some of these basic principles of when we talk about flow, what, what are we talking about? Um, very briefly, and this was a topic that I, I shared in a little bit more detail at the DevHops conference, when we ask about where is AutoRabbit as a company heading, um, I see there being five big challenges in Salesforce development, five big, pretty well unsolved challenges. One is keeping orgs in sync. As an industry, we do a not very good job of keeping orgs in sync. The second is tracking changes is not still not that easy. Um, uh, depending on your skill level, you know, can be very not easy and depending on the tools you have. Making sense of complex orgs, back to that idea of visualizing, understanding, disentangling the um, the org, the monolith. Enabling modularization, so you can actually get these very clear, stable, long-lasting boundaries between teams, areas of responsibility, different levels of risk associated with different modules than your metadata and so forth. And then finally, securing Salesforce. Because fundamentally, if your orgs are not in sync, it means you've somehow lost control of the process. If you can't track changes, you don't really know who's putting things in there and when and why did things get in there and is it meant to be like that? If you can't understand your complex org because of a lack of modularization, you can't really secure Salesforce. So you, you're fundamentally, if you can't understand the system, you can't secure it. And there's a lot of factors in Salesforce that make it very, very, very hard to understand, to actually understand what's going on in the Salesforce org. And thus, it's very hard to secure it. And when I when I say secure Salesforce, I do not mean securing the underlying network infrastructure of Salesforce. That's what you pay Salesforce to do. They employ a thousand full-time security specialists. They're doing a fantastic job. I believe Salesforce is the most secure enterprise software uh, platform in the world until you start configuring it. And as soon as you start configuring it, you, it is incredibly easy to open up vulnerabilities and risks. And that's the shared responsibility model. And that's where it is our responsibility to secure it. And so when we talk about tackling security, there's all of these different aspects. There's user permissions. Who? How many admins do you have in production right now? Do you know? What changes are they making, these admins? Metadata security. Have you designed your configuration, your code, and so forth in a secure way. Connection security. Are your APIs secured? Are you, you know, have you adequately secured your integration with all the other systems? And then especially this big one, communities, uh, stuff that's directly exposed to the public. The vast majority of Salesforce orgs are leaking a lot, a lot, a lot more data than they realize. So um, uh, vulnerable Salesforce configurations, an open secret in, in the community. So if I think about what would amazing look like, um, and again, this is a bit on AutoRabbit's sort of vision, simple, beautiful, clean design, compatible with Git, VS Code, these kinds of things, but abstracting away all of the complexity, um, handles the hard stuff. That's the way we want to think about it. Handles the hard stuff as elegantly as possible and optimized to help your team learn and improve. So that's our, our vision of what we're moving towards. We've got five pillars that we build on, um, focusing on visibility, security, quality, compliance, and continuous learning. So when we're considering how do we want to modify, adjust, evolve our own 
platform? How do we ourselves want to, you know, adapt, change, respond to the changing needs? These are the five areas that we uh, we put emphasis into in terms of uh, our innovation. But so that was all I wanted wanted to share with you here. I am delighted um, to handle uh, questions. If there are any questions that have come in in the QA, or if anybody wants to stick around for a bit and ask questions, I'm delighted to feel that for a little bit. But otherwise, that's that's what I had for you. Uh, super grateful for everybody's attention and interest. Yeah. I'll give everybody a minute or so to ask any, if anything comes in. But... What is the big why for, oh, Vernon Keenan. Hey, Vernon. Uh, what is the big why for using flow? So you, when you say using flow, it's tricky, right? Because what do we mean by flow and so forth? But the as I've used flow here, it's not something that you use, but it's something that you, it's a, it's a quality, it's a characteristic that you want to adopt. So I was talking about two main kinds of flows. One is the state of psychological flow. The big why there is, that allows us to make the best use of our our big brains, right? Makes allows us to make the best use. It's naturally satisfying. It generates creative output and so forth. When we talk about team flow, for example, when we talk about you know smooth handoffs from one person to another to another to another to deliver the results we we want, the big why there is avoiding waste, especially this big waste that you'll work on something and it'll never get used, or you'll work on something and it'll you know, it it doesn't bring the benefit it could have brought if you'd had earlier better feedback. So. Great. Um, thanks for the comment, Esteban. Chris Barba, um, so you're asking, you mentioned that it shared some of the future vision of AutoRabbit at the DevOps conference. Were those sessions recorded for those of us who could not make it? Um, they're not, but I think if we were to, if you talk with your customer success rep, Chris, we'd be delighted to do a session for you guys at um, I'd be okay, yeah. Great. Um, okay, so I'm not seeing any other questions just at the moment, but so it has been a real joy to have a chance to hang out with you. Um, and I wish all of you lots of flow both psychological and team workflow in in your work and good luck